Welcome back, friends, to another video. We are continuing our discussion of cash flow. So last week we talked about the difference between cash flow and profit. And this week I want to dive deeper into how to analyze cash flow. Now this is a little bit more of an advanced accounting topic. So if you're new to accounting, just hang in there because we are going to be covering some very important concepts. Any business is a cash flow generating machine. If your business is not generating cash, it is going to die. As a business leader, a lot of your job is managing cash flow. And when we talk about cash flow, we are describing how much cash is coming in the door and how much cash is going out. This is captured on an organization's statement of cash flows. Your statement of cash flows is split up into three sections, operating, investing, and financing. Now I'm going to stop here because everything beyond this point in this video is not GAAP. GAAP, or Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, says that you write your statement of cash flows with three categories for your investors. What I'm going to tell you is that you need to do even more work on top of this. You write your financial statements for your investors, but if you are a business leader, you have a lot more stakeholders than just your investors, so you need a more detailed breakdown of this report to make better business decisions. So you meet your requirement for GAAP first, but then you do even more work on top of that. In fact, most financial analysis that is done in business is done in addition to GAAP. But the reason you want to do all of this extra work is because it is so powerful for your business. Here's what you're going to do. Under the operating category, you can use the direct method or the indirect method. We are going to use the direct method here because you can actually see your operating expenses. You are going to start with your direct method for operating and split the expenses into two new categories, discretionary and non-discretionary. Just so you understand what I am asking. You need to go through every single one of your expenses and put them into one of two buckets, one for discretionary and one for non-discretionary. The reason this is beneficial is that for a business leader, not all of your expenses are really within your control. A lot of things that impact financial statements you have no control over. The price of things like rent, utility prices, insurance costs, these are not really going to change much. You can be as good a business manager as possible and you just will not impact some of your costs. The goal is to identify what is within your control and what is not within your control. This will help you to focus on where you can really impact your costs. Now, I know you're going to say, Zach, this is impossible. There is no way I can label every single one of my expenses. Well, it's really not as difficult as it sounds. Most of your non-discretionary expenses, like rent and utilities, are handled at the administrative level already. So it should be fairly simple to label your expenses at a department level. In fact, if you have department managers managing non-discretionary expenses, I would recommend pulling those expenses away from your managers and giving ownership of handling all non-discretionary expenses to accounting. All these expenses are not going to change anyway, so why are your managers wasting their time on it? This goes back to our goal to identify what is within your control. You are using accounting to focus everyone on where they can have the biggest impact managing expenses. The trick to doing this analysis successfully is to define the term discretionary. When you start going through this process, you're going to find it is actually very difficult to define discretionary. People will argue about where the line is where an expense turns into a non-discretionary expense. I have a very simple rule to define a discretionary expense. Any expense you can defer for six months without destroying the business is discretionary. 
If you can put off an expense for six months, that means you have adequate control over managing that expense. For example, you cannot defer your rent for six months. You're going to be kicked off your property, so that is non-discretionary. You cannot defer your utility payments. They will turn the lights off on you, so that is non-discretionary. Under this definition, payroll is also non-discretionary. You have to pay your people. However, what is discretionary is bonuses. In most cases, you can go to your people and say, we need to wait six months to pay out bonuses this year. That means it is discretionary. So here's some examples. Non-discretionary expenses are things like rent, utilities, and insurance. We've already talked about those. Payroll, I also include in this list. Now, I know people will argue with me that managers control their staffing plans, but in reality, that's not what happens in a business. Most staffing plans are set, giving people a certain number of hiring slots per year. Staffing plans is a whole other topic that I'm not going to cover in this video. Once your hiring targets are set, you cannot control that expense anymore. So from a financial standpoint, you should not use payroll as a way to do cost control. Payroll is off limits, and that is why it is non-discretionary. Taxes. You have no choice but to pay your taxes. Software licenses. You will have an annual IT subscription and internet costs that you have every single year. Next is inventory for orders. If you have orders to fill, you obviously have to pay for the materials you need to fill those orders. Next is required maintenance. Now, maintenance is one of those difficult areas because people will argue that all maintenance is necessary. But that's not really true. Any maintenance that can wait for six months is discretionary. That is not to say you will wait. You're just trying to figure out what you have control over and what you do not have control over. Next is debt payments. You always have to make your debt payments. Now this is in your financing section of the statement of cash flows. Under GAAP, there is some flexibility how this is displayed on the statement of cash flows. You need to separate out interest and principal. However, for this exercise, you just need to know that you have to make your debt payments. This is non-discretionary. Now under discretionary, we have things like bonuses, travel, and marketing. Now of course, Marketing is going to impact your business, but if you had to, you could probably stop your marketing activities and delay them six months. Donations. Now, these will be expenses you incur for community outreach. Research and development. This is another really important expense, but it can be delayed six months if needed. Computer upgrades. If you want to buy new laptops for your staff, that can be delayed six months. We have deferrable maintenance and also capital improvements. And this is gonna be any large expense of machines or equipment, usually over $5,000. You generally wanna capture this in your investing category on the statement of cash flows. And finally, dividend payments. These are gonna be any payouts to investors captured in the financing section of your statement of cash flows. When you go through this exercise, you're going to notice a few things. Most of your expenses will be non-discretionary. For most businesses, rent, inventory, and payroll are your biggest expenses. What you actually have control over is a smaller, more focused part of your financial statements. Now that you have all your expenses defined, you're going to get to the real heart of the issue. How do you spend your discretionary money? That is really what you want to know. You have a pot of money that you have control over. What is the most effective use for those funds? How you answer that question will determine your effectiveness as a business leader. To answer that question, you need to look at your stakeholders. Any business will have at least these stakeholders, if not more. Employees, customers, vendors, community, media, trade unions, business, government, and investors. Now, I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but you should. As a business leader, your job is to figure out how your business is serving each one of these stakeholders. Is it adequate or not?
For example, let's look at employees. Are you taking care of your employees? Are you paying them enough bonuses? Another example is community. How much are you donating to community outreach? The business itself is an important stakeholder. Are you continuing to reinvest back into the business to continue to grow? So you have this pot of discretionary money. You need to look at your expenses and split them up so that you're servicing each one of your stakeholders. One of the main takeaways here is that investors are only one of your stakeholders. You are writing financial statements for your investors. However, you still have to think about all of these other people. A major problem that a lot of businesses have is they take their discretionary funds and they allocate them too much towards one group of stakeholders at the expense of the rest. So they might be paying out too much to investors or the managers might be paying themselves too much to their own bonuses. When these things happen, the business becomes unbalanced and that makes it difficult to sustain long term because you need all of these stakeholders for a healthy business. That is why business leadership is so difficult and why you need to do this additional analysis beyond just writing your financial statements. You have a limited amount of money and you are trying to manage a healthy business and make sure that everyone is taken care of. Your goal is to make sure your business continues to be a cash flow machine for everybody. I know this was a lot of information. Some of you may have not heard this information before. Well, next week, I'm gonna show you how to take all of this information and put it into one chart. Now, I don't see a lot of people out in industry using cash flow charts like this, mostly because it takes so much work to put all of this together. But when you see the chart that I'm going to show you, it's going to blow your mind and show you how powerful cash flow analysis can be to helping you make good business decisions. If you found this video helpful, go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Zach from Wolves and Finance. Let's go out and make some money.